Hey, it's JB, and welcome back to Rock Explaining. Today, I want to show you every little tiny way that I messed up when I was teaching myself how to play the guitar intro to Jimi Hendrix's Little Wing. You guys might relate to a lot of this. You might relate to all of it. Regardless, get a beverage because it's about to get pretty granular. Let's go. Rock Explaining. So everybody knows the intro to Little Wing. Um, it's one of those rites of passage that you sort of teach yourself when you're learning guitar, when you're kind of getting into your intermediate stage. For me, I was 18 or so. I had been playing guitar for about two years, and this was a little over my level, which was kind of the point. I wanted to test myself and see if I could play something that beautiful. And, you know, with those little complexities and subtleties that Jimmy has, and it was an awesome education for me. But this was the 1980s, and there was no YouTube, there was no internet, there wasn't even really a good resource for tutorials or anything. You either learned it from somebody who already knew it, or you learned it off a cassette like I did, just playing those little bits and pieces over and over again until you thought you had it. But with no experience, really, musically, or not even that much in life, I was only going to pick up what I could pick up at that time. And the funny thing is, all these years later, I've never revisited it. I've never gone back and, and listened for it and said, did I miss anything? So, but I always had a hunch I did. So what I decided to do is go back, put on some headphones, listen to Jimmy's intro many times, not anybody else's version, not Stevie Ray's, not anybody else, but just Jimmy's original version from Axis Bold as Love and see if I could pick up some stuff that I missed. And then I went and watched a whole bunch of tutorials by uh, Tim Pierce and Alberto Lombardi, who did a great thing. I, I also watched Marty Schwartz. These were all really good. I'm going to link to all of them in the description. Um, if you really want a tutorial, uh, you can get all of their different takes on it. But what I wanted to see is if there was any, you know, any little discrepancies between these different tutorials and what I could glean from listening to Hendrix with fresh ears. So... Of course, there were. There were some little things that they that they each kind of missed that the other one picked up. And uh, I tried to compile those and see how many ways I messed up when I learned it. And the answer is many ways. Now, why would we want to play this exactly like Jimmy? I don't necessarily think you do. Um, most people have their own interpretation of it. Uh, Stevie Ray has a famous, wonderful interpretation of this song that became kind of a reference point in the back of our minds because it was so good. And a lot of other, it's kind of it's kind of one of those things you do. You kind of have your own take on Little Wing, and that's great. So I'm not saying we need to slavishly emulate every little thing that Jimmy did, but for those of you who are interested to zoom in and see what he did, whether it's because your own version feels a little off or you just want to nail it or just you want to stand in awe, of the majesty of Jimmy. All those are totally legit reasons to go in there, even if you end up adapting it and making it your own at some point. So this is not a performance video. This is me going through this thing chord by chord and unearthing all the little ways that I got it wrong. I'm gonna have a counter up here, counting the things that I missed. So uh, just to let you know, there won't be any fancy schmancy guitar going on here. We're just, we're in a learning mode. This is rock splaining. So let's splain some rock. My guitar is tuned to E flat. So you're going to want to tune your guitar to E flat. Uh, Strat style guitars just really do open up and sound fantastic in E flat. They just seem happier somehow. So I'm starting to get used to that. I have not adjusted my intonation or my action for E flat. So it's a little bit, you know, sprangly. So just be careful uh, listening to that. Yeah, so tune. And we're gonna be in position four. Now I know there has been some debate about what position Hendrix played this in. Some people say it was the neck pickup, which I understand but it wasn't. It was position four, which is between the neck pickup and the middle pickup, as far as I can tell. That's the only one that makes it all work correctly for me. One of the reasons that I think 
uh, people think it's the neck pickup is because Jimmy has a tendency to play this kind of stuff up here by the neck pickup. And normally my hand wants to be over here by the middle pickup. You'll hear a whole bunch of times in here where he's got this, he's got this sound that you only get up here. I'll, I'll show you in a second. But that gives position four a very, very different tone than it normally would where your hand naturally falls. Now, it's interesting to note that Stratocasters in the 60s, when Jimmy recorded this, didn't have position two and four. So you actually just had to manually kind of squeeze the thing to right between those two and get it to sit there and not fall into one of the three positions that the switch actually had. So there were no in-betweens, but Hendrix, I don't know if he discovered this or how big of a role he had to play, but I have a feeling it was pretty huge in popularizing the use of positions two and four, which we sometimes call the quack positions. All right, so let's get started right at the beginning. Here we go. Wrong already. I barely played anything and I already found a spot that I messed up. I don't know if you can hear it. These two notes sound too thin by themselves compared to the real thing. I know lots of guys play it like that. I played it like that. What do you think's missing? Is it the, the 12th fret on the third string? Nope. You mute that one. You mute the third, fourth, and fifth strings. What you add is the sixth string. I'm sure some of you know that, but I didn't. So that's it right there. So what do we know so far? Swing time, right? He's spelling it out in no uncertain terms. Super swingy. And here's where it gets, where it's, it starts to get crazy immediately, basically. He starts playing in the open position. And that's where you can hear a little giveaway for position four. That doesn't sound the same anywhere else. Let me try playing it up here. But here's how I played it. I played it swinging, right? Because he's... He's doing this. So I go. Wrong. Jimmy plays it in straight time for mysterious reasons that I'll theorize on in a minute. He plays it real straight. Now that sounds okay by itself, but when you play it after this. You see how you want to swing it? You want to go, do 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 And I'm sure Stevie Ray did. I'm sure most of us do it. Jimmy did not. So there you go. So that's the E minor going to the G. And I'm going to refer to these as if we're not tuned to E flat. I'm just going to call it E minor, G, B minor, etc. cetera. Um, that's not actually what they are because we're detuned, but it's way easier to talk about the song. Now, let's go to the G. Let's see what we got. Okay, wrong. According to the tutorials I found, everybody seems to agree that it's an open third string there. So, an open third string without, without putting your third finger down. So, I don't know if this is important, but it does seem to be something that is agreed on. So, let's roll with it. Now, we're still in straight time. Listen closely. It's going tick, 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 tick. It is not going tick, 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 tick. We're going to go boom. Doon, 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 doon. Like really straight. And then that goes away. As soon as we hit this note, so as soon as we hit that one, we switch over to swing time. It's crazy. So. So, so far we've got a swung intro, straight, and then straight. Swing. No 
straights in there, swinging hard. That chord, I think, I think I had it all right. That's really how you're supposed to play it. And there's a last little muted note there. That little drink it down. There's a little thing there, which I wasn't playing before, so that was wrong. Now we're in the E minor, the E minor reprise, or the E minor slight return, if you will. It goes boom. Now when we're in there, it's beautiful, but he plays it really straight, straighter than your hands want to go. So that's an example of him playing it really straight. Now I'm going to talk about it. So one of the things Hendrix talks about sometimes is, uh, you know, his, his variety of influences. And he names classical sometimes. And what I see Hendrix doing in some of these songs is putting these little classical flourishes in the middle of his swinging R&B playing. And he'll do it sometimes with the whole beat of a song. There's a few examples outside of Little Wings, so we're going to take a slight detour, and then I promise we'll get right back to it. But this is an important note because it's something that doesn't get talked about a lot in Hendrix's playing. Okay, so quickly, let's talk about The Wind Cries Mary. The verse part is nice and kind of relaxed, swingy feel. After all the jacks in their boxes And the clowns have all gone to bed And Mitch is swinging away, right? And then all of a sudden it goes like this What is that? have to play it so in the solo you'll hear it too in the solo of a wind cries mary i'm not going to play the whole solo but listen to it and you'll notice that that the rhythm guitars are playing swing and then hendrix's solo overdubbed on top of it is played straight to the point where you can't even believe it he's actually on top of the beat it's nothing like you might remember it in your head. And it ends like this. It's like... Doo -doo 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 it's very British. Uh, probably more British than anything Clapton ever played. They sound like they should be played on a harpsichord. Which reminds me, um, in another tune from Electric Ladyland... Here is the burning of the midnight lamp where he actually puts a harpsichord on it and he goes. And it goes. <laughs> Doesn't get any more. That is so 1700s. Do you have any gray poupon? I feel like we should be wearing a powdered wig and white, white, white socks or whatever they're called. Anyways, I haven't really heard it discussed as being classical influences, but you know he does talk about that sometimes about the about thinking about Bach and and Handel and stuff like that. So. You know, our boy was as eclectic as they come. Last example I'll give you is Highway Child, which I also have not practiced, but it's a blues shuffle all the way, right? It's got that kind of feeling. He left home when he was 17. Lost on the world he loves. And it just keeps going like that. And wait for it. All of a sudden. It, 
goes super straight. You might uh, call him a tramp. Well, I know it goes a little deeper than that. He's a highway child. The point is, <laughs> is that he loves to switch back and forth from swung to straight time. And one of the most interesting examples of it is in the intro to Little Wing, which we're going to get back to right now. So that's that. Now we're in the B minor. And to be honest with you, this is probably the trickiest bit for me, the next three chords. Now, Hendrix had enormous hands. I do not. So that might be part of the problem. I want to play it with my thumb, but just the fingering felt a little suspicious in a couple of spots. So let's, let's pretend he's barring it. And for the sake of argument, play it that way. And then there might be a rationale for that in a second. So, okay. So he plays only single notes for the first three. You don't hear this pretty chord. I played like this. That was wrong. He just plays the single notes. And then when he plays this high note, that's when you start hearing the chord. Now immediately, we run into another one. I don't know how many guitar players I have seen play it like this. B minor, B flat minor, A minor. It makes total sense because it's a descending chromatic move. Watch what Hendrix really does. He goes. What? Did you hear it? It's a major chord. Some of them got it right and played this. There's, there's a D natural there. It's a very strange move. But it's cool because it's Hendrix. All right. And I'm pretty sure he's playing straight there too. Yes, he is. So we got B minor straight, B flat major straight. That little passing chord being both major and straight, I both had wrong. So that's two wrongs. That's two times. All right. Sorry for the sloppiness, but that's the basic part. Now, when we get to the A minor, it's tricky. I used to play it in the open position because my stretch wasn't very good. So I would play it like this, which sounds okay, but it's wrong. Hendrix probably did this barring thing because he goes like this. I'm going to play that super slow. Now, to be honest, my stretch almost doesn't want to do that one, but if I get into this crazy barring position, it works. And that is as pretty as it gets because it has this beautiful tension in it for a half a second, which gives it this real heartfelt kind of moment, this sort of, um, I don't know, it's almost like a little cinematic moment. And he's playing it all straight. Now right here, nobody plays these with two downstrokes, but that's what's on the record. So check it out. Now right there, I noticed that a lot of the tutorials do a slide right there, which is fine but it's not right. That's one part that I did get right. I distinctly hear a hammer on. No matter how many times I listen to it, I don't hear that little telltale, that little slide. You don't hear it. It's like this. Okay. Which brings us to the G. I was listening really close and it really sounded to me like it wasn't the open string. So let's say it was the fretted G note on the D string. Now we have this moving chord, right? But 
but the way he plays this is a little different than I thought, of course. So here's what I'm hearing. Slides up with the thumb. And then he cuts this chord off for a second. It doesn't connect all the way. I thought it did. That was wrong. It goes like this. You hear how it stops for half a second? And there's a low note under it. A little, there's a little moment there. Okay, when we get to the F, there's another huge one here. Everybody wants to play all kinds of stuff on there. And Stevie Ray really milks that chord. He goes like, does all these nice little rakes. But on the Hendrix version, you're not going to believe it. Once he hits this chord, you never hear those high strings ever again. It goes. That's where the Leslie speaker kicks in and you start hearing some stereo movement and some cool swirlies there. But the point is, Jimmy doesn't play these high notes anymore. He just plays those three chords. And then he, everything else is in the low part. And you even have to take your finger off of the third fret of the fourth string right there. You can't hold the chord. You got to get your finger off of there in order to play this note on the fifth string. So... And with the Leslie, it sounds fantastic. Okay? I totally played that wrong. Next one. It goes to a C major. Wrong. It goes to this weird C6 chord that you have to put your second finger on two strings. You have to bar two strings. I always knew something was funky about this. It's really this chord. Okay, so there's, there's a, a C, uh, you know, like a one, a three, a six, and a two or a nine. Really a two in this case. So we're going to go. You hear it? So we're, we're coming up from the F. It's funky, kind of challenging. So that little chord is a lot more interesting than we thought. And then it goes to a straight D power chord, which I used to play as a full chord with a major third in it, which was wrong. And it waits, it, it holds that. Or is it? Anyway, it's swinging now, okay? We're swinging all through this thing. Pretty sure this is all swinging. And that's the end. He goes straight again and plays it Grey Poupon style. It's like that. Dun, 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 dun. I'm telling you. So we've got Hendrix playing R&B guitar, kind of adapted from Curtis Mayfield. And these R&B feels, which are very much... And I've seen a lot of great R&B players. They're real comfortable swinging with all downstrokes. You know, that feeling. You can really hear that Jimmy did a lot of downstrokes in that style. But when you get to this kind of thing, it's so straight. Nobody I have heard includes these straight parts as straight as the original version. The only way that your brain will even process it and let you try to get the feeling for it is if you consciously switch back and forth between swinging and straight, like this R&B feel to this classical feel. 
And I think that's a really under-discussed aspect of Hendrix's musical world. You know, he was trying to integrate all these different influences and absolutely nailing it. But they were highly, highly unusual. So I hope that all makes sense. Uh, I hope I didn't take too long getting through that. Maybe someday we'll do the guitar solo. I am of the belief that the guitar solo from Little Wing, uh, this, this stuff... That stuff is so good, it merits its own discussion. I, that It's one of his finest solos, and that's really saying a lot. But now, if you kind of go through this and listen for all those little missing kind of bits, you might actually find your way through Little Wing very differently, and it might give you an appreciation of the kaleidoscopic mind of the one and only Jimmy. So hope that's useful or entertaining or interesting in some way to you guys. I kind of found it fascinating. Yet another one of these little rabbit holes that I found myself going down. And that's it for now. I'll see you in the next video.